Let's talk about why Savannah, Georgia is so haunted. The following video includes pictures and descriptions of death from diseases and crime. Viewer discretion is advised. Savannah is one of the most haunted cities in the U.S. At least that's what all the brochures say. When I started sharing ghost stories about Savannah on my TikTok, a lot of people seemed to be surprised by just how many stories there were. There are older and much larger cities in the United States. So why does a city that's been around for 288 years with a living population of around 145,000 have so many spirits lurking? While Savannah may not be as old as New York or Boston or even Charleston, it's still seen a lot of history. Portions of both the Revolutionary War and the Civil War were fought here. In fact, the Sons of Liberty conspired in pubs on Broughton Street to end Britain's control of the Georgia colony. Savannah is where General Sherman ended his infamous march to the sea. This coastal city has seen two detrimental fires, several yellow fever epidemics, an earthquake, a major hurricane, and last but certainly not least, slavery. Some of these things even occurred simultaneously. Most spiritualists will tell you that circumstances like that can leave energy that sticks around long after the events are over. Yellow fever was a huge problem for the port city. Before mosquitoes were proven to be the cause, bad air was blamed. People kept windows open thinking that would help the air circulate, but all that did was invite in more mosquitoes. The fever got its name from the jaundice that can turn victims' skin and eyes yellow, but that's not the worst part. Yellow fever causes muscle aches, internal bleeding, organ failure, and vomiting of blood that can appear chunky and black like coffee grounds. Every year, the Davenport House Museum has a living history presentation that gives people a first-hand look at what it was like to live in 1820 during the time of yellow fever here in Savannah. I was able to speak with Jamie Creedle, the director of the Davenport House Museum, about what people would have been dealing with in Savannah then. So you have this community that had been ravaged by a terrible fire on January the 11th, 1820. Uh, people, you know, 460 buildings were destroyed. It's sort of inconceivable today. It was uh, written up in the national papers as a, a civic calamity. So you've got, uh, you know, a devastation and people, no homes, um, and, and then trying to figure out how to relieve the suffering. Just like after a hurricane, I don't know if they're opportunists, but people come in to rebuild the city. Usually what has happened, if you get yellow fever and you survive about, you're pretty much immune. But you got new people coming in to help rebuild the city who had never been in this part of the world before, had not experienced yellow fever. So those people are in town. You got all of these burnt up um, foundations of buildings, and then you got a mild winter and a wet spring and summer, which are ideal conditions for the breeding of the mosquito that causes yellow fever. And so you got this water standing around, and then you've got these people that are not immune. And it started over in Washington Ward, which was sort of the flop house area of town where the people that were workers were staying. And so people were getting sick over there, and they thought it was because the people over in that part of town sort of blaming the victim, you know, poor people, working people, it was their fault for not keeping their lots clean. They were just filthy people. So, um, so people were getting bitten right and left. People were getting sick. And, of course, um, then the, the, the fevers just started moving around town to the different wards. And the, the health department would go and inspect them. And finally, hundreds of people dying. Um, the um, health doctors, four in a, the, um, the medical commission, um, four doctors finally said, you know, this is an epidemic. And by the end of the yellow fever, I think was it uh, – Two of the four doctors were dead as well. And people didn't always just run to the doctor or take a pill for something. If they went to the doctor or, or a housewife, they would you know, puke or purge or bleed or blister you to get your bodily fluids um, back in balance. Um, so, and if, you know, there were fevers every year. Um, um, and there was, so just because they had yellow fever, 
didn't mean there was an epidemic. The epidemic meant that it was just a huge proliferation of people that were not, um, uh, had not survived a bout of it before. And there were doctors who were sort of trained, um, but, you know, we recently found in a newspaper ad from 1821, a doctor in town was looking for a teenage boy to apprentice with him. So it wasn't, so some people have formal training, some people apprentice with a doctor, and some people just said they were doctors. And then there were people like root doctors and folk medicine people that, that knew from experience what would cure people or what would make people feel better. So what you would do if you had been to leave the city, which meant the people who did the poor people and probably enslaved people would be left here. So that's what happened in 1820. I think this population was 7,000, close to 8,000 people. And um, I think at the end, uh, in October, there were about, you know, 1,500 left in the city. One bit of folklore that gained popularity during yellow fever outbreaks was something called paint blue paint, similar to what you see behind me. The Gullah Geechee people used it on doors, windows, and ceilings to keep away bad spirits, including the ones that brought the fever. Today we know it's chemical components in that paint that actually kept mosquitoes away. Even still, you can see the paint used on many porches throughout the South. Another lasting reminder of a major disaster still seen today is the presence of earthquake bolts in some of the buildings downtown. The bolts, designed to strengthen a structure against earthquake damage, were very popular in the years after the Great Quake of 1886. Savannah residents were scared out of their wits when tremors shook the ground. An earthquake centered in Charleston was felt here in Savannah too. Buildings collapsed, some people died from injuries or shock, and quite a few people were sent to mental health asylums. Just a few years before, 335 people were killed when a hurricane hit the city. Savannah doesn't get hit often by hurricanes due to its unique geographic location tucked inside the Georgia coast, but in 1881, a Category 2 storm swept into the state. One traumatic event that often gets left out of details about Savannah's haunted history is slavery. Yes, we know it happened. Savannah's in the South. But slavery left many people dead and families torn apart. It's interesting to note that when Savannah was originally settled, slavery wasn't legal here. General Oglethorpe, who established the colony, was staunchly opposed to it. But when people started threatening to move to South Carolina where it was legal, civic leaders caved. We know that slavery has left plenty of intergenerational trauma in its wake. One of those traumatic events in Savannah is called the Weeping Time. In March of 1859, a plantation owner named Pierce Butler auctioned off 436 people, including children and babies, to cover his debts. Over two rainy days, couples were split up and children were sold to separate owners. Every year, Savannah marks this time with a remembrance ceremony. And we can't forget that Savannah is a city literally built on its dead. As the port settlement grew, cemeteries were turned into developments for new houses and businesses. I'll talk more about this in an upcoming video. But I think it's important to point out that you may be eating, sleeping, or walking on top of forgotten graves whenever you're downtown. This is a lot for one city to endure, and most of it happened within a 100 year time span. I've spoken with historians who are surprised that Savannah still exists, given all it has survived. Author Flannery O'Connor once said that Savannah is haunted by religion. I think it's haunted by its history. Regardless of whether or not you believe in the paranormal, walking through certain parts of downtown, you feel like you could turn a corner and run into a Civil War soldier or a Victorian couple out for a stroll. The air here is thick with the past. I personally feel like the environment here created by catastrophe and expansion makes it hard for spirits to leave. 